Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Chiam. Uh, I'm the founder and managing director of Eco Business, and I'm really delighted and thank Endowas for this invitation to moderate this really interesting panel. I feel like I've been given a gargantuan task, uh, given that SOP and you know Sam has mentioned ESG so many times, and there's this sense that there is maybe some ESG fatigue. But I think that in this panel, we're going to really kind of offer some new insights that provide you with the perspective that we cannot have ESG fatigue and it's relevant to us today. Also one point to note, the private wealth panel, majority men, ESG panel, majority women. I don't know if that's a reflection of how men and women think about ESG investing, um, but I think that's um, something to reflect on. If I can just you know, open this discussion really with just a very quick um, context, why is ESG investing important to all of us today. I think if you look in the newspapers, you can see that the cost of living crisis is something that is really kind of uh, affecting everyone in their daily lives. And this has been predicated really by the triple whammy of the COVID-19 crisis, um, climate change, as well as geopolitical tensions, including the Russia-Ukraine war. And I think that it's really interesting how ESG investing has evolved over the years because it used to be a fringe issue and then it became mainstream, and now it's being hijacked by the political parties, um, and it's going, it, we're having a really interesting discussion now about how ESG is uh, effective or not. But I want to quote uh, something that you know, I really, um, it really resonated with me in this WWF documentary around our business, and that really is there are no jobs on a dead planet. And so ESG investing is relevant to us today because if we do not have guidelines for responsible investing, there will be nothing for us to invest into in the future. And I'm really delighted to have with me today on this panel some really eminent speakers in this space. And I'm just going to deep dive into it as we have a lot to cover in just a short 30 minutes. Sylvia, I'm going to start off with you. How have the attitudes of investors been towards ESG evolved around the world and especially in Asia? And have you seen this momentum kind of growing and what is you know, your overview of where it's heading as well? Sure, thanks Jessica. I'm happy to be here. I'm Sylvia Chen, Senior Sustainable Officer at Amundi Singapore. So for me, within the ESG ecosystem, um, uh, for my scope, I look at green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bond space, as well as part of the Asia um, transition, um, because it's such a huge space of where I'm located in. Um, so for that question, um, Jessica, it's definitely very interesting. For the past few years, you'll be amazed. Just as recent as last year's, um, their clients even asking, what is ESG? Um, and, and is it really important? And how, how is it not sacri sacrificing the returns? So really have to show evidence during um, some of the market volatility that ESG investing is sustainable, is less volatile. Um, although, again, this year we're seeing a uh, huge volatility across pretty much all asset classes, and yet energy, um, a lot of the ONG or energy sectors actually outperform. But we believe that it's a short term, it's temporary responses, um, not to add it to our long-term commitments within the ESG space. So I think for the, um, for the investors, especially for um, Asia-based, we see that, that trans transition is moving away from really the basic of ESG onto more specific questions, deep dive into actually what matters to them from the ESG perspective, what is their objective, and what is required for them to get there. Um, a lot of time, we, if you look at a large um, asset managers, the trend we're seeing, also what we observe, is a transition moving away from exclusionary. So you probably heard of the normative, um, normative basis or those um, principal bases in terms of exclusions on the sectors or in terms of the ratings, onto ESG integrations. How, what are the different ESG factors that are critical into the whole investment pro processes and decision makings? And actually, the lately talks about thematic engagements or thematic um, strategies, uh, as well as the impact 
So we are trying to quantify what is the real world impacts and what does it matter to the end consumers. Um, for the talks about ESG, they may not understand that's relevant to them, if, but if you tell them about you know, the number of trees that you saved, the number of affordable housings that you can provide, th those are more real turn and more they can relate it to. So these are the trends that we are seeing in general on a broad basis. There's also another interesting trend we see as they touch on you know, the younger generation of investors. We recently did a survey in partner with Business Times. So what we did find out is actually for the Singapore-based investors, there's a shift toward the younger generations, uh, and actually their focus is more toward the social causes. You'll be surprised because you thought um, Singapore, the inequality may not be as big of an issue on the surface, but actually that matters to them close to their heart on the social causes um, for the younger generation, be it the Gen Z or the young millennials. So those are the interesting findings that we're seeing and would like to share as well. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, I think you, you know, highlighted some key points about its evolution. And I think one of the points that we want to discuss here today is the changing regulations. Because if you look globally, obviously Europe has been way ahead and it has been issuing you know, the Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation. And it's been ranking uh, different asset classes or uh, investment uh, products as light green, dark green. And then we've seen the backlash against greenwashing as well, where we have you know, Deutsche Bank being raided by the police for greenwashing and then actually some money managers removing the ESG label because they don't want to be called out for that. And in this you know, context of the lack of comparability of ESG ratings, I think Sot mentioned in the fireside chat about the data set that is so necessary. Perhaps I can you know, ask Dave to give us um, your view you know, from the academic perspective. How can um, academia help to bridge the ESG knowledge gap? Or maybe the industry in general help to improve ESG data so that this movement can become further mainstream than more entrenched with, you know, science-based and um, good decision-making behind it. Well, well thank you uh, for the question and thanks for inviting me to this panel. I'm so happy to be adding diversity uh, <laughs> to this uh, panel and by that I mean uh, having someone who's not part of the, directly the financial sector, having an academic uh, here uh, on this uh, panel. But for those of you who've known me for the past 25 years that I've been in Singapore, I of course was uh, on the sell side for the first uh, 20 plus uh, years uh, of that and, and now about five years at Singapore Management uh, University. So just a, a quick quiz first before I get to your question, which is I'm the director of the SimKey Boone Institute for Financial Economics uh, at, uh, at SMU. Uh, Singaporeans in the room, do you know who Mr. Simki Boone was? Yes. So in case you don't, uh, we will be having a book, uh, a biography launched uh, about him uh, uh, next uh, Friday. The uh, forward was written uh, by the PM. Uh, we'll get some airtime at the Milken uh, Summit uh, a week uh, before the, as the F1 is, is starting. We think it's a story worth telling. Uh, a, a bureaucrat, not a rich guy, uh, not a politician, uh, which is how you typically get your name on something at a university. Uh, instead, when he passed away in 2007, Singapore rallied um, uh, and, and, and raised a significant amount of money to endow uh, at SMU this institute. Our mission is to bring academics and the financial sector uh, together. Um, and so uh, we pivoted to this area of sustainability uh, as one of our main focuses uh, three uh, or so years uh, ago. Uh, and our job is really twofold. And it goes to this confusion that's out there. Jessica highlighted. We uh, uh, we see our role as twofold: to be truth tellers and teachers. Uh, so to uh, to be honest, brokers in terms of what is happening in these new developments, including in uh, sustainability-linked uh, uh, products, and also to educate investors as these new products uh, come out. So again, truth tellers and, and teachers. So again, I noticed I was on the sell side for you know, 20 years, um, and uh, I know uh, from that experience that commercial imperatives uh, might sometimes lead uh, someone with a new product to maybe cut corners a little bit, uh, to sell pretty hard, uh, something new that they have uh, that they want to attract uh, funds uh, to. Uh, so uh, the academics uh, can play a role. 
uh, in this space by being uh, truth tellers. Uh, also, investors want to know about these new products, and so that role of as being a, a teacher is our our second uh, uh, second big role. So. Um, we can start by you know, the truth-telling side being skeptical. That's what academics uh, do. All right? We don't believe you. We want to see proof. And we're going to take our time, unfortunately, uh, in studying it. Uh, sometimes the timeliness is a big problem. But to try to come up with an objective analysis about you know, whether or not these products are really doing uh, well, as, as well as doing good, uh, as everybody would very much uh, like to believe, as one example of how academics have certainly uh, gotten involved. Um, you, just, you mentioned the specific area of ESG ratings, and of course we'll hear a lot more uh, about that from Chitra. You know, but uh, I got to tell you, this is where the academics have sort of had a field day. It's been a, almost coming on to three years where it, it's just merciless. I mean, so in terms of probably the most cited paper, uh, Berg et al., MIT group out of 2019, uh, they clearly documented uh, the inconsistency uh, across the different ESG ratings, uh, as well as it, the actual same ESG rating over time. All right, so uh, a, a real skewering of uh, whether or not you should be uh, trusting uh, these. I just flew in uh, from the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment Conference in Zurich, which is the largest academic conference in this, and I just uh, picked up two papers while I was there on ESG, I just cite them, ESG ratings, uh, that uh, one study showing that ESG ratings Ratings, using ESG ratings to uh, divest your holdings actually hurts social welfare, and having a high ESG score is not necessarily telling to an institutional, uh, telling to be an institutional investor leader. So again, truth is sometimes pain, you know, it's difficult, but that you want that credibility. You want academics to be in there to say, really, is this? Uh, what's the problem here? Is this really what the, the bill of goods is being sold, especially in such an important uh, and, and, and new area? So um, what we need is a call you know, for your input uh, as we are doing this. Uh, it, it, uh, it can sometimes turn out maybe not the result you want. But you can bring us in. Uh, it's noted I'm the co-director of the Singapore uh, Green Finance Center. Uh, and we have already have a lot of partners, many of whom are uh, endow us uh, partners here on the board. I'll just go through the list of, uh, of, of uh, our founding partners. Uh, Bank of China, BNP Paribas, Fullerton Fund, Goldman Sachs, HSBC, Schroeders, SMBC, Standard Chartered, and UBS, uh, led by the MAS. Uh, for me, with my uh, background uh, in, in, the, in, in the private sector, I said we can't just have this be a university MAS driven thing. We need uh, your involvement. We need private sector involvement to guide academics uh, as to the areas that we're doing. But that's, I think, our main role is to, is to be uh, truth tellers. I'll just say the second, quickly on the second part, which is teaching. Because as, as you've heard, investors, especially younger people, really want to know. But then, again, being a bit of a downer, do these guys know what they want and what they're getting into uh, as they uh, allocate funds uh, into ESG space? So um, financial literacy in general, but then financial literacy on sustainable finance is an area that we're exploring very deeply. Uh, and DAO us, uh, together with some other partners, including uh, the uh, um, SGX, uh, Lo Boon Chai is, is the chairman of my advisory board, uh, and the Singapore government, MoneySense, uh, which uh, I don't know if any of you Singaporeans, again, actually used MoneySense. We basically found no one does, uh, or very <laughs> few people do. It's an incredible resource, but it hasn't really penetrated, uh, especially young people. So we went and looked at these areas. Why isn't it happening? What do people, uh, why aren't people getting up the curve if they say they want to know? Uh, what mistakes uh, could they make? Uh, we, we did a, an SMU class, experiential class, getting students together with Endowist, together with MoneySense, together with SGX, Grab, and, and C Group also were part of it, to try, hands on try to get through this and so that we can get people up the curve and educated uh, in this important area. Thank you very much, Dave. I think you brought, brought up some salient points around how it's still very early days, actually, in terms of the industry converging on a set of ratings and methodology in order to raise the credibility uh, of ESG ratings. I know this is an expertise of Chitra, so I'm going to come to you. And I know that you've just landed this morning from New York, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, 
from your global perspective, you know, as kind of head of ESG, looking at APAC and then also having links to the global markets, where do you see ESG going? And could you also comment perhaps a little bit about Dave's observations around the inconsistency of ESG data? Oh, absolutely. So this is <laughs> geographically, certainly, there's a lot of inconsistencies, as you can imagine. So firstly, just an introduction. Uh, my name is Chitra Hepburn, and I head up um, Asia-Pacific ESG Research and Climate um, for, for MSCI. Um, and what we do essentially is get, get all our data together um, to then create tools and analyses for investors to use different lenses. So ESG ratings happens to be one lens, and then we've got other lenses that look at climate tools, some of them forward-looking, and some of them just looking at you know, status quo today. What does it look like in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? So um, briefly, so, uh, for those that know, ESG is something that really took off in Europe a long time ago, way longer than in APAC. So they've had a head start and they've put a lot of regulations in place. It's one, EU regulations impact all of the countries there, so it's a lot more easier to look at it as, as one change that they need to make across different jurisdictions. Um, and I think we see the same thing in the US somehow. It's a little bit more homogenous if you take North America as one. What we have here in APAC is, is an extremely diverse and, and a very different sort of um, ESG profile, if you like, for every country that we see here. So if I were to just look at Japan or China, there's almost nothing in common in the way that they approach ESG or even climate. And it's the same to be said if you were to look at Australia or then here in Singapore, completely different. And this isn't just purely a matter of um, the countries then being at a certain stage economically to adopt ESG or to integrate ESG. I think it's also for each one of them, the priorities are very, very different. And I think when you look at the energy mix across in China, and you've got quite a lot of fossil fuels there, Japan's had to contend with nuclear as being part of its energy mix. And um, then you go down further to Australia, and you know, mining is, is a huge part of their economic base. And so you've got this very different mix of priorities across Asia Pacific. Um, so leaving Europe aside, where they come up with quite a lot of regulations that work in Europe, I don't think they're easily transposable on the APAC economies. So what you do have here is some sort of an alliance to certain types of regulations. So you've got, for example, Hong Kong, Singapore and Malaysia have chosen to go more TCFD based. If you look at Taiwan and Japan, then they're choosing to use more stewardship codes to guide where they go. Um, and then Australia, where we've heard them talk about it a lot, um, they're only just starting to take action because their political climate changed very recently. And you've now got um, a, a party in charge that actually believes in all things ESG. In fact, the mandate of that that entire election was based on ESG factors. So that's what you have geographically across what we're observing. From what we're hearing our clients tell us, then I would have to echo what Dave says. There needs to be a little bit more of a standard look at what this is and what it isn't. And I think part of it is also how ESG has evolved over all this time. And it started off as being a tool for basically investment professionals or institutional investors to then have a lens through which they could look at the resilience of companies uh, when they looked at risks that were particularly sort of focused on the environment or social or governance. So it was less to do with impact as it started out. And as time goes on, now you're hearing more about impact investment, you're hearing more about you know, how does this, there's a thing called double materiality that both of you know, um, and that's really looking not just at the resilience of these companies from a financial perspective, but then also looking at what is their overall impact um, from an environmental and social perspective. And those are quite different issues. And I think where we're coming to in Europe is a convergence of those issues and trying to look at double materiality as being one thing that we need to be able to look at. Now, because what you measure in ESG and climate are very different things, um, particularly when you're looking at the type of statistics. So I'd say 
on the E pillar, as you probably all know, greenhouse gas emissions, or you're looking at carbon footprint, these are more quantifiable, and they're, they're easier for people to maybe put you know, on one level playing field. But when it comes to social aspects that Sylvia brought up, those are much harder to quantify. These are qualitative judgments. And again, they have a cultural nuance to it. What might be socially relevant in Japan is very, very different when you bring it down to, say, Indonesia or further down to Australia. So I think it's, it's there where we have been working for 15 years to try and create a rules-based methodology. And what it does is it takes apart all of that data, and it's only attributing it industry by industry. And that means we're not comparing a bank to a fossil fuel company. It's just within peers, so all banks, you know, next to each other, juxtapose them and then figure out how they figure. Because we believe everyone's on a journey or some sort of a spectrum of adopting ESG or for that matter, climate positive attributes. And so that's roughly where we see where things are. I could obviously go on forever about the differences in Asia Pacific and I don't want to, uh, but happy to take questions later there, I know. Thank you so much, Chitra. I think you uh, bring up some very uh, you know, important points. Um, and it's a good segue into the next question I have for all the panelists. And that's really kind of related to credibility and ESG data. And that is the big issue of greenwashing. The FT kind of published a um, opinion piece earlier this week called The Future of ESG is at the Crossroads. And it talks about how there's a lot of skepticism around ESG because there's a camp that thinks that businesses should be solely existing to make profits, the Milton Friedman type of perspective. And then, of course, the other camp that believes that the role of business really is to enable societies, prosperous societies, you know, that protects ecosystems, that protects um, the communities. And I think that ESG has had, you know, a bad run, I think, in the press as well, because there have been many funds or money managers that have, you know, put the ESG label on so many things. And today you see that you could have a high ESG score, like you mentioned, Dave, right? And you could be Exxon, and it's not very responsible for the environment. And you could have a low ESG score, um, and just basically not have any responsibility or not caring. For example, there's also a debate going on about how public listed companies are subject to a lot more compliance and disclosure rules. But then, you know, once they divest, then the opaque private equity funds come in and they scoop up all these investments and nobody has any idea what they're doing in terms of safety, of worker protection, of ecosystems protection. So, you know, how are we to respond to something like that? I mean, it's a huge challenge for the industry. I think, Jessica, you're right. That's a really delicate question. It definitely require a balance where companies are for profit and where is their social responsibility comes in. And that's an increasing question we're asking the companies related to actually beyond ESGs um, in really setting about double materiality, how important their impact is in the operation, um, throughout their operations to other stakeholders. So for example, there was a recent case we we're looking at Coca-Cola. So it's one of the most popular um, drinks um, in the world, but they are actually the top polluters in terms of the seashore waste. And the reason is because not of their own disposing the bottles, but it's people, consumers, finishing their bottle, but just dump it onto the seashore or uh, polluting in the river, and then um, uh, just ended up in the seashore. But does it mean that Coca-Cola is not doing enough? Maybe. So what is the investor are trying to do is asking them, do you have any schemes to make sure your bottles are recyclable? Um, do you have any incentives to increase your consumers to do more actions on recycling your bottles after the end use? So it's a, it's, a, it's a turn of the whole life cycles, of course, and you have to think far ahead, not just producing a product, selling um, across the world, but actually what ends up. Um, to, to your product at the end of the consumer, um, end of the product life. Dave, Chitra? I just wanted to add a little bit on uh, perhaps what we're seeing as, as a trend right now, which is most of the regulators anywhere in the world are starting to step up in terms of requiring disclosure. Now, you brought up something saying public companies disclose a lot more than private ones do. Um, and I, I would say, yes, that is wholly true when it comes to mandatory disclosures and what they're having to do. What, where I think public companies are starting to step up, and I think previous panelists touched on that a little bit, is there's a lot more 
um, scrutiny in terms of consumers, and certainly in, in wealth, you've got a lot younger consumers who want to know, well, exactly where's my money going? Show me on a portfolio. Um, and, and that could be green to brown, or it could be some other scale. But really that transparency, that increase in transparency that's required more and more, is, is creating a space where it's harder to hide, and it's harder to pretend to be one thing when you're not. Um, because to your point, you know, the FT did a piece now, but I'm very grateful actually to all of media that's been writing so much about ESG, whichever way it goes, <laughs> because five years ago we just never got this amount of airtime, so it's all good. Um, but, but I do feel that it's in its infancy, that's another thing I do need to, to draw out here. Ten years ago, n not only was no one talking about it, there wasn't as much integration or adoption of ESG, so it's fairly young, it's new, requires a lot more thought and effort, and certainly requires it across the ecosystem, investors, academics, enablers like ourselves, and as well, you know, MAS and others, all of that needs to come into play for, for greenwashing to then be a thing of the past. Um, but, but, you know, the more everyone starts to request for a little bit more information and dig deeper, mm. um, and also, as we mentioned earlier, there is a need to clarify what it is and what it isn't. So, yeah. I, would, I would say that's uh, really where we're at, growth phase. <laughs> Just picking up on the point on ESG being in its infancy, mm -hmm. I think that ESG in the future, in the very near future, will become a hygiene factor, mm -hmm. actually, that you see all companies or, or financial products having that. And, you know, the gentleman before in the previous panel was saying that some clients have, you know, they want ESG funds or non-ESG funds. Yeah. I think in many minds, all funds have to have a certain hygiene, you know, basic level of ESG. And then, of course, you have different extents of, you know, where do you want the greatest impact? Is it climate? Is it oceans? Is it food? Um, I think that variety is coming up. Um, and I, I want to move to the... the Maybe we could just oh, okay. on, on trend, just something about the infancy and in, in trends, especially for, for, for firms. You know, I, I think it's super important. Uh, everybody knows how new this is. Again, I was I only was on the sell side for 20 years up until four or so years ago, and definitely was not a thing. Mm -hmm. In Singapore, uh, right, transformationally was National Day um, uh, speech when PM, you know, cited it as an existential threat, uh, which, you know, if you look up existential, if you don't know what that means, you know, for Singapore, this place is, 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 is its existence uh, is at risk. And, and, and uh, the raising of wanting to Singapore to be a global green finance center shortly after that, that's when I raised my hand and said, let's be part of the academic side of that. And we got going. But all of this is new. Uh, of course, Europe has is, is been ahead, but I'll tell you, it doesn't take long to, to get up there. And we want the Asian, and that's where you need to play into it, because it can't all be driven uh, out of Europe. Uh, it just isn't applicable in so many cases, as you just said. Uh, the Asian voice at the table is so critical as this develops. And I would say that as this develops, uh, you know, as we talk about how you know, people are being careful, wondering about how, what their role is. Well. We can do, you can do this two ways. You can say, hey, there's backlash, and it's happening, right? The ESG backlash is happening. We see that political politicization, especially in the US. And you can say, you know what? I think that's it. I think it's going to roll back. Uh, and there are anti-ESG funds that are developing. People are getting as dirty as they can and showing returns, All right? You could go that way. Uh, or you can do the opposite, and you can jump to the end and be a leader. That's where kind of this niddling academic saying, oh, the ratings aren't so great. So what, right? We're building something. And so where will it head? And the word impact has been brought up. And it's a very broad word, right? So we're not going to, I think the idea of impact assessment broadly, positive and negative, you're going to look at a company and say, yeah, you pollute, negative. Are there other things that you're doing that should be on this, especially on the social side, uh, or other things that people are doing, carbon capture, all the rest of it that can be positive on the, uh, on the E side? And the, it's really hard, but you might as well get there because your stakeholders are going to be pushing you in the future, and that's the feedback you should be doing, you're getting ahead of, and you should be telling your companies. It's tough because you got to monetize that. You got to put a yep. dollar figure on it so you can compare across these impacts. But that's something that we're working on together with the Impact Institute in, in the Netherlands, together with Harvard Business School. Um, we think people might as well jump to the end and uh, don't fight it, be a leader, uh, especially out here in Asia. 
Yes, I think you brought up some great points here. And one of the things that I say often to the boards I speak to is that expect that you're being scrutinized and ranked, whether you like it or not. You know, that's not a choice anymore. And I think for the public listed companies that the pressure is greater. And if you're not thinking about disclosing to the TCFD or disclosing your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, then you're very, very far behind the curve. I want to move the conversation a little to the retail investor. We've had a few re interesting questions here um, for, for, from them. And I'd like to, you know, uh Put a shout out to Endowas. I know Sam's not here and he didn't ask me to say this, but when they first launched, I was really impressed that you were able to go on the platform and actually, as a retail investor, invest into ESG funds. And you know, just a few years ago, three years ago, you know, I asked my relationship manager, I won't say which bank, you know, wh whether I have some you know, sustainable products. And I, I got like this blank look, and then I had to explain to them what a sustainable or ESG fund was, and then they said, no, there's nothing available. It's obviously different today. But in terms of the access that retail investors get to you know, ESG funds or impact-related um, products, where if they want their money to go further, and Patricia had mentioned earlier you know, about women investors, younger investors being more uh, curious. Um, and I also want to steal a phrase from her. She talked about crypto and how family offices and investors are crypto curious and not crypto committed. The same can be said for ESG investing, I think, or impact investing. And how can we move the needle then? And I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, one question from an Endowas investor here is, I'm interested in ESG related investments, but what is the difference between an ESG ETF, ESG index, and ESG fund? As a new investor, what would you recommend? And then a related question to that, I think, is what is the biggest obstacle to ESG investing? Will we see this become a 100 trillion asset class? Maybe we ask the investor to answer the investor <laughs> question. We'd definitely <laughs> love to see that's becoming a, 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 one, a one trillion asset class. But um, in reality, I think what an investor need to ask is, what is their ESG objective? What's the definition about ESG? Mm. We need to talk about the same ESG we're talking about. From the product perspective, what they're selling, does it mirror to what you believed in? Is it what you want to do? Is it the social causes or whether it's environment, um, whether you're, you're interested in circular economies or diver, uh, biodiversities? And to look at what how can you measure this besides the financial returns? Um, many times, um, financial returns may be volatile, but we need to look at the real world impacts that really matters to you, what you feel most materials. Um, and talk to your financial advisor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add one more thing to that. This is not um, a short-term punter's market. So you're really looking at change that's going to be in the mid to long term. And everything you're trying to do is actually trying to impact um, an industry positively, if you can, through that mid to long term lens. And so I think it takes a little bit of patience and it takes a little bit of education where Dave comes in. Um, one, what, you know, what to choose. Um, and you mentioned that earlier, that they don't quite know, as new products come out, what, what should I actually be picking? Uh, but then, to Sylvia's point, the objectives that you want to achieve. Um, and then what many investors are choosing to do, particularly in wealth and younger investors, they're looking at a very specific kind of impact. So if they feel that they have a pet cause that they want to invest in, and I think Pat brought that up earlier, that women tend to have that laser focus on what they want to have an impact on. I think if you put all of that together, that, that sort of a, a kind of guidance, but certainly we all need help, and whether you go to academics or a financial advisor, one hopes that today there's a lot more choice and people are actually able to offer that choice to you. Um, and if it's not there, then guaranteed in six months there will be because there's been so much talk around it. So I'm pretty sure it's going to be top of the agenda. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, layup for me. And I mean, in terms of retail, it, it's all about education. Uh, again, this academic conference I just came from studied uh, ESG funds and, and fees. The topic was brought up in the last panel. And guess what was the highest explanatory variable for willingness to pay higher fees? Lower financial literacy. 
right? And so I think it is all about educating those retail investors to just in the broad uh, sense, but also on the specific desire, because we know the desire is there, but we just need to get, make sure they know what they're doing, uh, and that'll make for a better environment for all of us. Thank you. And a bit of a plug here, but for the investor who asked about the difference between the ESG products, if you sign up to the Eco Business newsletter and look at our news website, you'll find all the answers there. Um, if I can move on to the next question, really, and I think this is a question for Amundi and MSCI, for, for Silva and uh, Chitra. We've seen you know, the market kind of being a really volatile um, situation, and there's a lot of macroeconomic forces, including the Russia Ukraine war. There's a question here around whether we, you have seen lower interest in ESG products and indices because of the underperformance of these funds. And then a related question to that really is that as the global economy continues to grapple with the war and energy prices keep increasing, how is this going to impact ESG funds? Um, okay, so that's two questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. To depart, and then I'm looking forward to anything you can add yeah. on to it sure. as well, Sylvia. Um, so on the first, have we seen a drop in interest? I think it's been quite, um, without, without um, ruffling any feathers here, it's been quite geographically pronounced, that loss in interest, if I can say that. So across the pond, a lot more. Um, but, but I think not in Europe so much. And, and here in APAC, I think there's a lot more opportunity that people can see because it's a growth region. So you still have a lot of, of funds that are doing the right thing, but also able to still show some growth. So I think it really depends on where you are. The energy crisis, I can't downplay this. It's had a huge, huge impact on how people are looking at energy mix. I met a fund manager the other day who called his fund a transition fund. That's about anything, right? A catch-all for you can move between fossil fuels and renewables at will um, and, and be at any you know, sort of stage of transition, if you like, even going backwards. Um, so I think there is that where people are trying to exercise a certain amount of flexibility. Um, but I think in, you know, if you're looking at the longer term and you're looking at where we will be in 20, 30 years time, if you look at the graph of what um, any, any of the forward looking projections show, um, you're going to have to move into a renewable transition economy just because we're going to run out of all other options. Um, so I, I think if, again, coming to the mid to long term view, that is the future. How soon people choose to embrace that and say, I'm on, it's something like what Dave was saying, you could step off and say it's not happening. But that would just be, you know, sticking your head in the sand. I think it is happening for sure. Question is, when do you want to jump on board? Yeah. Any adding, yeah, adding that, I think last year, November, COP26, you see growing momentum of net zero ambitions mm -hmm. that was set out. We haven't seen uh, any uh, nations have been backing down on any of their commitments. Um, obeyed, some of them are reverting back to fossil fuel as temporary responses. But I think in a long term, mid to long term commitment base, there's uh, currently there's no backing down on that, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, of course, depending on how um, the situation goes, pay now, but many of the alternative solutions are becoming more real be it the nuclear um, nuclear options or hydrogens may be more feasible as well, not alone the renewable energy um, in terms of as to ramp up as much as possible. Of course, it, it requires some time in terms of productions um, for some of those projects, and uh, the near winter is just um, uh, just approaching, and it's one of the emergency, of course, um, in the meantime. But other than that, I think all other investments need to still step up on the clean solution part. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would just say, I mean, in, in the markets now for in Singapore for 25 years, and we've things, I've seen things come and go, and I keep wondering, oh my gosh, is that it? Mm -hmm. Are we going to stop this? Yeah. And you know, for those of you who haven't uh, read this or go back <laughs> and read, you know, uh, S. M. Tharman's brilliant, you know, speech back in at the IMS conference back in March, the long, perfect, you know, storm, a couple of weeks after the Ukraine invasion, and among the what his point is, it's a long, perfect storm because these things are not cyclical 
local. They're not one-off. It's not a convergence of coincidence. This are structural things, and the, the sustainability trend is, is one of those. And so it's, it's not going to uh, go away despite all of the... Uh, instead, you're going to see accelerations that the European winter, I think you're going to see that pivot, and you saw Secretary Yellen's speech just here where you know the U.S. is behind, and they're going to double down in terms of alternatives and other things to, to move forward. So I do think it, it's, it's, uh, it's safe to say uh, that this will keep going, and the best thing to do is to get ahead of it. I don't hope if you are been resistant to it, um, embrace it <laughs> and, and try and push to be a leader. Well, I have you here, Dave. I'm going to just take one last question from the audience, and that is actually a question around, you know, the, the point you made around financial literacy, which is that if you were a retail investor, what factors can, should you be considering when you look at ESG funds and whether they have quantifiable commitments to its sustainability and not just lip service? Wow, it's so hard, I would say, right now, given the options that are available for a retail investor to know. I think the ratings are still the most valuable uh, input uh, that you can have on that, despite all the academic uh, skepticism. Uh, there are a range of those, so I would you know, pull all of those uh, ratings uh, in uh, as your entry point uh, to try as a retail investor to, to navigate. But things are evolving. Uh, and I would say that reputation, as was said before, this is so critical. And the calling out of funds, you know, the greenwashing accusations are, I think, important. <laughs> uh, you're going to see people hopefully be more careful uh, and there be some consequences, I think, uh, for those funds. So as a retail investor, I think you should pay attention to those too. Thank you. Very well put. I think, you know, uh, wrapping up this panel with my last fire round question, um, what is the one thing that you'd like to see happen in the next year, which you think would make a meaningful difference to ESG investing? Siva, I'll start with you. Um, really greater standardizations of the ESG definitions that we're talking about. Greater standardization. Uh, I would say that uh, my first job was, you know, I spent a lot of time in the private sector. My first job, though, was at the Central Bank in the U.S. and the Federal Reserve. And I want, we need the sovereigns to lead even more. Uh, and because we all know about the country level commitments, but regulatory moves everything. And so we've seen that happen in Singapore at a minimum, think that them pushing on risk, stress testing, all of that stuff. And we don't see yet enough of that happen in other geographies. So I think that uh, as well as, by the way, uh, allocating some of your sovereign uh, wealth into this area, which is also still at emerging stages. So I'd like to see governments uh, step up even more. Yeah, on that point, actually, I think GIC and Tomasic has done quite a good job of allocating the investments into sustainability-driven uh, thesis. So thank you for raising that point. Chitra? I'd like to add to both, actually. So yes, standardization are common language definitions that help us you know, speak to each other in exactly the same way and understand what we're talking about. Um, but, but the second part of it would be, as a follow-on, the disclosure. So when that disclosure rate gets to a stage where you've got enough data that you can rely on, it becomes a space where you're less skeptical because you've actually got the data to back it up. And I think people can see that transparently. And um, that's sort of been our onus has been on getting enough transparency in the market. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And I think for me, the response really would be knowledge and education, mm -hmm. because I think that it all starts with knowing your environment and knowing what's affecting all of us and then allocating that dollar that you own in the most responsible manner. So thank you so much for all those insights. Thank you, speakers. Please join me to thank them for a really insightful discussion.